Chapter 2. Chemical Components of Cells It is at first sight difficult to accept that living creatures are merely chemical systems. Their incredible diversity of form, their seemingly purposeful behavior, and their ability to grow and reproduce all seem to set them apart from the world of solids, liquids, and gases that chemistry normally describes. Indeed, until the 19th century, it was widely believed that animals contained a vital force, an animus, that was responsible for their distinctive properties. We now know that there is nothing in living organisms that disobeys chemical or physical laws. However, the chemistry of life is indeed a special kind. First, it is based overwhelmingly on carbon compounds, the study of which is known as organic chemistry. Second, it depends almost exclusively on chemical reactions that take place in a watery or aqueous solution and in the relatively narrow range of temperatures experienced on Earth. Third, it is enormously complex. Even the simplest cell is vastly more complicated in its chemistry than any other chemical system known. Fourth, it is dominated and coordinated by collections of enormous polymeric molecules, those formed from chains of chemical subunits linked end-to-end, -end, whose unique properties enable cells and organisms to grow and reproduce, and to do all the th other things that are characteristic of life. Finally, it is tightly regulated. Cells deploy a variety of mechanisms to make sure that all their chemical reactions occur at the proper place and time. Chemistry, in a sense, dictates all of biology. In this chapter, therefore, we briefly survey the chemistry of the living cell. We will meet the molecules from which cells are made and examine their structures, their shapes, and their chemical properties. These molecules determine the size, structure, and function of the living cells. By understanding how these molecules interact, we can begin to see how cells exploit the laws of chemistry and physics to stay alive. Chemical Bonds Matter is made of combinations of elements, substances such as hydrogen or carbon that cannot be broken down or converted into other substances by chemical means. The smallest particle of an element that still retains its distinctive chemical properties is an atom. The characteristics of substances other than pure elements, including the materials from which living cells are made, depend on which atoms they contain, and the way these atoms are linked together in groups to form molecules. In order to understand how living organisms are built from inanimate matter, therefore, it is crucial to know how the chemical bonds that hold atoms together in molecules are formed. Cells are made of relatively few types of atoms. Each atom has at its center a dense, positively charged nucleus, which is surrounded at some distance by a cloud of negatively charged electrons, held in orbit by electrostatic attraction to the nucleus. Figure 2-1 the nucleus consists of two kinds of subatomic particles, protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which are electrically neutral. The number of protons present in an atomic nucleus determines its atomic number. An atom of hydrogen has a nucleus composed of a single proton, so hydrogen, with an atomic number of 1, is the lightest element. An atom of carbon has six protons in its nucleus and an atomic number of six. Figure 2-2. Two, two. The electric charge carried by each proton is exactly equal and opposite to the charge carried by a single electron. Because the whole atom is electrically neutral, the number of negatively charged electrons surrounding the nucleus is equal to the number of positively charged protons that the nucleus contains. Thus, the number of electrons in an atom also equals the atomic number. All atoms of a given element have the same atomic number, 
and we shall shortly see that this number dictates the chemical behavior of the element. Neutrons are uncharged subatomic particles with essentially the same mass as protons. They contribute to the structural stability of the nucleus. If there are too many or too few, the nucleus may disintegrate by radioactive decay, but they do not alter the chemical properties of the atom. Thus, an element can exist in several physically distinguishable but chemically identical forms, called isotopes. Each isotope having a different number of neutrons, but the same number of protons. Multiple isotopes of almost all the elements occur naturally, including some that are unstable. For example, while most carbon on Earth exists as a stable isotope carbon-12, with six protons and six neutrons, there are also small amounts of an unstable isotope, the radioactive carbon-14, whose atoms have six protons and eight neutrons. Carbon-14 undergoes radioactive decay at a slow but steady rate, which is the basis for the technique of carbon-14 dating of organic material in archaeology. The atomic weight of an atom or the molecular weight of a molecule is its mass relative to that of a hydrogen atom. This is essentially equal to the number of protons plus neutrons that the atom or molecule contains. Because the electrons are so light that they contribute almost nothing to the total mass. Thus, the major isotope of carbon has an atomic weight of 12 and is symbolized as 12C. The unstable carbon isotope just mentioned has an atomic weight of 14 and is written as 14C. The mass of an atom or a molecule is generally specified in Daltons, one Dalton being an atomic mass unit approximately equal to the mass of a hydrogen atom. Atoms are so small that it is hard to imagine their size. An individual carbon atom is roughly 0.2 nanometers in diameter, so that it would take about 5 million of them laid out in a straight line to span a millimeter. One proton or neutron weighs approximately 1 over 6 times 10 to the power of 23 gram. Hydrogen has only one proton with an atomic weight of 1, so 1 gram of hydrogen contains 6 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms. For carbon with an atomic weight of 12, 12 grams of carbon contain 6 times 10 to the power of 23 atoms. This huge number, 6 times 10 to the power of 23, called Avogadro's number, is the key scale factor describing the relationship between everyday quantities and numbers of individual atoms or molecules. If a substance has a molecular weight of m, a mass of m grams of the substance will contain 6 times 10 to the power of 23 molecules. This quantity is called 1 mole of the substance, figure 2-3. The concept of mole is used widely in chemistry as a way to represent the number of molecules that are available to participate in chemical reactions. There are 92 naturally occurring elements, each differing from the others in the number of protons and electrons in its atoms. Living organisms, however, are made of only a small selection of these elements, four of which, carbon, C, hydrogen, H, nitrogen, N, and oxygen, O, make up 96.5% of an organism's weight. This composition differs markedly from that of the non-living inorganic environment, figure 2-4, and is evidence of a distinctive type of chemistry. The outermost electrons determine how atoms interact. To understand how atoms come together to form the molecules that make up living organisms, we have to pay special attention to their electrons. Protons and neutrons are welded tightly to one another in the nucleus, 
and change partners only under extreme conditions, during radioactive decay, for example, or in the interior of the sun or of a nuclear reactor. In living tissues, only the electrons of an atom undergo rearrangements. They form the accessible part of the atom and specify the rules of chemistry by which atoms combine to form molecules. Electrons are in continuous motion around the nucleus, but motions on this submicroscopic scale obey different laws from those we are familiar with in everyday life. These laws dictate that electrons in an atom can exist only in certain discrete regions of movement, roughly speaking, discrete orbits, and that there is a strict limit to, to the number of electrons that can be accommodated in an orbit of a given type, a so-called electron shell. The electrons closest on average to the positive nucleus are attracted most strongly to it and occupy the inner, most tightly bound shell. This innermost shell can hold a maximum of two electrons. The second shell is farther away from the nucleus, and its electrons are less tightly bound. This second shell can hold up to eight electrons. The third shell contains electrons that are even less tightly bound. It can also hold up to eight electrons. The fourth and fifth shells can hold 18 electrons each. Atoms with more than four shells are very rare in biological molecules. The arrangement of electrons in an atom is most stable when all the electrons are in the most tightly bound states that are possible for them, that is, when they occupy the innermost shells, closest to the positively charged nucleus. Therefore, with certain exceptions in the larger atoms, the electrons of an atom fill the shells in order, the first before the second, the second before the third, and so on. An atom whose outermost shell is entirely filled with electrons is especially stable and therefore chemically unreactive. Examples are helium with two electrons and an atomic number of two, neon with 2 plus 8, atomic number 10, and argon with 2 plus 8 plus 8, atomic number 18. These are all inert gases. Hydrogen, by contrast, has only one electron, which leaves its outermost shell half-filled, so it is highly reactive. The atoms found in living tissues all have incomplete outer electron shells and are therefore able to react with one another to form molecules. Figure 2-5. Because an unfilled electron shell is less stable than a filled one, atoms with incomplete outer shells have a strong tendency to interact with other atoms so as to either gain or lose enough electrons to achieve a complete outermost shell. This electron exchange can be achieved either by transferring electrons from one atom to another or by sharing electrons between two atoms. These two strategies generate the two types of chemical bonds that bind atoms to one another. An ionic bond is formed when electrons are donated by one atom to another, whereas a covalent bond is formed when two atoms share a pair of electrons. Figure 2-6. In the case of the covalent bond, the pair of electrons is often shared unequally, with one atom attracting the shared electrons more than the other. This results in a polar covalent bond, as we will discuss later. An H atom, which needs only one more electron to fill its shell, generally acquires it by sharing forming one covalent bond with another atom. In many cases, this bond is polar. The other most common element in living cells, C, N, and O, which have an incomplete second shell, and P and S, which have an incomplete third shell, C figure 2-5, generally share electrons and achieve a filled outer shell of eight electrons 
by forming several covalent bonds. The number of electrons an atom must acquire or lose, either by sharing or by transfer, to attain a filled outer shell determines the number of bonds the atom can make. Because the state of the outer electron shell determines the chemical properties of an element, when the elements are listed in order of their atomic number, we see a periodic recurrence of elements with similar properties. An element with, say, an incomplete second shell containing one electron will behave in much the same way as an element that has filled its second shell and has an incomplete third shell containing one electron. The metals, for example, all have incomplete outer shells with just one or a few electrons, whereas, as we have just seen, the inert gases have full outer shells. This arrangement gives rise to the famous periodic table of the elements which is outlined in figure 2-7. Elements found in living organisms are highlighted. Ionic bonds form by the gain and loss of electrons. Ionic bonds are most likely to be formed by atoms that have just one or two electrons in their unfilled outer shell or are just one or two electrons short of acquiring a filled outer shell. These atoms can generally attain a completely filled outer electron shell most easily by giving electrons to or accepting electrons from another atom, rather than by sharing them. For example, returning to figure 2-5, we see that a sodium Na atom with atomic number 11 can strip itself down to a filled shell by giving up the single electron external to its second shell. By contrast, a chlorine Cl atom with atomic number 17 can complete its outer shell by gaining just one electron. Consequently, if a Na atom encounters a Cl atom, an electron can jump from the Na to the Cl, leaving both atoms with filled outer shells. The offspring of this marriage between sodium, a soft and intensely reactive material, and chlorine, a toxic green gas, is table salt, NaCl. When an electron jumps from Na to Cl, both atoms become electrically charged ions. The Na atom that lost an electron now has one less electron than it has protons in its nucleus. It therefore has a net single positive charge, Na+. The Cl atom that gained an electron now has one more electron than it has protons and has a single negative charge, Cl-. Positive ions are called cations, and negative ions, anions. Ions can be further classified according to how many electrons are lost or gained. Na and potassium, K, have one electron to lose, so they form cations with a single positive charge, Na plus and K plus. Magnesium, Mg, and calcium, Ca, have two electrons to lose and form cations with two positive charges, Mg2 plus and Ca2 plus. Because of their opposite charges, Na plus and Cl minus are attracted to each other and are thereby held together in an ionic bond. A salt crystal contains astronomical numbers of Na plus and Cl minus packed together in a precise three-dimensional array with their opposite charges exactly balanced. A crystal only one millimeter across contains about 2 times 10 to the power of 19 ions of each type, figure 2-8. Substances such as NaCl, which are held together solely by ionic bonds, are generally called salts rather than molecules. Ionic bonds are a type of electrostatic attraction, an attractive force that occurs between oppositely charged atoms. See panel 27, pages 76 to 77. 
Because of the favorable interaction between ions and water molecules, which are polar, many salts, including NaCl, are highly soluble in water. They dissociate into individual ions, such as Na plus and Cl minus, each surrounded by a group of water molecules. We discuss electrostatic attractions and the other non-covalent bonds that can exist between atoms later in the chapter. Covalent bonds formed by the sharing of electrons. All of the characteristics of a cell depend on the molecules it contains. A molecule is a cluster of atoms held together by covalent bonds in which electrons are shared rather than transferred between atoms. The shared electrons complete the outer shells of both atoms. In the simplest possible molecule, a molecule of hydrogen, H2, two H atoms, each with a single electron, share their two electrons, thus filling their outermost shells. The shared electrons form a cloud of negative charge that is densest between the two positively charged nuclei. This electron density helps to hold the nuclei together by opposing the mutual repulsion between the like charges that would otherwise force them apart. The attractive and repulsive forces are in balance when the nuclei are separated by a characteristic distance, called the bond length, figure 2-9. Whereas an H atom can form only a single covalent bond, the other common atoms that form covalent bonds in cells, O, N, S, and P, as well as the all-important C, can form more than one. The outermost shells of these atoms, as we have seen, can accommodate up to eight electrons, and they form covalent bonds with as many other atoms as necessary to reach this number. Oxygen with six electrons in its outer shell, is most stable when it acquires two extra electrons by sharing with other atoms, and it therefore forms up to two covalent bonds. Nitrogen, with five outer electrons, forms a maximum of three covalent bonds, while carbon, with four outer electrons, forms up to four covalent bonds, thus sharing four pairs of electrons. See figure 2-5. When one atom forms covalent bonds with several others, these multiple bonds have definite orientations in space relative to one another, reflecting the orientations of the orbits of the shared electrons. Covalent bonds between multiple atoms are therefore characterized by specific bond angles as well as bond lengths and bond energies. Figure 2-10. The four covalent bonds that can form around a carbon atom, for example, are arranged as if pointing to the four corners of a regular tetrahedron. The precise orientation of the covalent bonds around carbon is the basis for the three-dimensional geometry of organic molecules. Covalent bonds vary in strength. We have already seen that the covalent bond between two atoms has a characteristic length that depends on the atoms involved. A further crucial property of any bond, covalent or non-covalent, is its strength. Bond strength is measured by the amount of energy that must be supplied to break a bond, usually expressed in units of either kilocalories per mole, kcal per mole, or kilojoules per mole kj per mole. A kilocalorie is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one liter of water by one degree Celsius. Thus, if one kilocalorie of energy must be supplied to break 6 times 10 to the power of 23 bonds of a specific type, that is, one mole of these bonds, then the strength of that bond is one kcal per mole. The other unit, kj per mole, derived from the SI units, Système International de Unités, universally employed by physical scientists 
is increasingly used by cell biologists. One kilocalorie is equal to about 4.2 kilojoules. Typical strengths and lengths of the main classes of chemical bonds are given in Table 2.1. To get an idea of what bond strengths mean, it is helpful to compare them with the average energies of the impacts that molecules continually undergo owing to collisions with other molecules in their environment, their thermal or heat energy. Typical covalent bonds are stronger than these thermal energies by a factor of 100, so they are resistant to being pulled apart by thermal motions, heating, and are normally broken only during specific chemical reactions with other atoms and molecules. The making and breaking of covalent bonds are violent events, and in living cells, these events are carefully controlled by highly specific catalysts called enzymes. Non-covalent bonds, as a rule, are much weaker. We shall see later that they are critically important in the cell in the many situations where molecules have to associate and dissociate readily to carry out their functions. There are different types of covalent bonds. Most covalent bonds involve the sharing of two electrons, one donated by each participating atom. These are called single bonds. Some covalent bonds, however, involve the sharing of more than one pair of electrons. Four electrons can be shared, for example two coming from each participating atom. Such a bond is called a double bond. Double bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds and have a characteristic effect on the three-dimensional geometry of molecules containing them. A single covalent bond between two atoms generally allows the rotation of one part of a molecule relative to the other around the bond axis. A double bond prevents such rotation, producing a more rigid and less flexible arrangement of atoms. Figure 211. This restriction has a major influence on the three-dimensional shape of many macromolecules. Panel 21, pages 64 to 65. Reviews the chemical bonds commonly encountered in biological molecules. Some molecules contain atoms that share electrons in a way that produces bonds that are intermediate in character between single and double bonds. The highly stable benzene molecule, for example, is made up of a ring of six carbon atoms in which the bonding electrons are evenly distributed, although the arrangement is sometimes depicted as an alternating sequence of a single and double bonds as shown in panel 2-1. When the atoms joined by a single covalent bond belong to different elements, the two atoms usually attract the shared electrons to different degrees. Compared with a C atom, for example, O and N atoms attract electrons relatively strongly, whereas an H atom attracts electrons relatively weakly because of the relative differences in the positive charges of the nuclei of C, O, N, and H. By definition, a polar structure in the electrical sense is one in which the positive charge is concentrated toward one end of the molecule, the positive pole, and the negative charge is concentrated toward the other end, the negative pole. Covalent bonds in which the electrons are shared unequally in this way are therefore known as polar covalent bonds. For example, the covalent bond between oxygen and hydrogen, OH, or between nitrogen and hydrogen, NH, is polar. Figure 212. The bond between carbon and hydrogen, CH, by contrast, has the electrons attracted much more equally by both atoms and is relatively nonpolar. Electrostatic attractions help bring molecules together in cells. In aqueous solutions, covalent bonds are 10 to 100 times stronger than the other attractive forces between atoms, allowing their connections to define the boundaries of one molecule from another. 
But much of biology depends on the specific binding of different molecules to each other. This binding is mediated by a group of non-covalent attractions that are individually quite weak, but whose energies can sum to create an effective force between two separate molecules. We have already described the ionic bonds that hold together the Na plus and Cl minus ions in a salt crystal. Electrostatic attractions are strongest when the atoms involved are fully charged, as Na plus and Cl minus are. But a weaker electrostatic attraction also occurs between molecules that contain polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds are thus extremely important in biology because they allow molecules to interact through electrical forces. Any large molecule with many polar groups will have a pattern of partial positive and negative charges on its surface. When such a molecule encounters a second molecule with a complementary set of charges, the two will be attracted to each other by an electrostatic attraction that resembles, but is weaker than, the ionic bonds that hold together salts such as NaCl. When enough of these weak non-covalent bonds form between two large molecules, their surfaces will stick specifically to each other, as illustrated in Figure 213. However, water greatly reduces the attractiveness of these charges for each other in most biological settings. Water is held together by hydrogen bonds. Water accounts for about 70% of a cell's weight, and most intracellular reactions occur in an aqueous environment. Life on Earth is thought to have begun in the ocean, and the conditions in that primeval environment put a permanent stamp on the chemistry of living beings living things. Thus, the chemistry of life has been shaped by the properties of water. In each molecule of water, H2O, the two H atoms are linked to the O atom by covalent bonds. The two bonds are highly polar because the O is strongly attractive for electrons, whereas the H is only weakly attractive. Consequently, there is an unequal distribution of electrons in a water molecule, with a preponderance of positive charge on the two H atoms and negative charge on the O. See figure 212. When a positively charged region of one water molecule, that is, one of its H atoms, comes close to a negatively charged region, that is, the O of a second water molecule, the electrical attraction between them can establish a weak bond called a hydrogen bond. These bonds are much weaker than covalent bonds and are easily broken by the random thermal motions due to the heat energy of the molecules. So each bond lasts only an exceedingly short time, but the combined effect of many weak bonds is far from trivial. Each water molecule can form hydrogen bonds through its two H atoms to two other water molecules, producing a network in which hydrogen bonds are being continually broken and formed. It is because of these interlocking hydrogen bonds that water at room temperature is a liquid, with a high boiling point and high surface tension, and not a gas. Without hydrogen bonds, life as we know it could not exist. The biologically significant properties of water are reviewed in panel 2.2 pages 66 to 67. Not all hydrogen atoms form hydrogen bonds. In general, a hydrogen bond can form whenever a positively charged H held in one molecule by a polar covalent linkage comes close to a negatively charged atom, typically an oxygen or a nitrogen, belonging to another molecule. Hydrogen bonds can also occur between different parts of a single large molecule, where they often help create special shapes, but the hydrogen bond is just one member of a family of weak, non-covalent bonds that play a crucial role in allowing large molecules to fold up in unique ways and to bind selectively to other molecules, 
as we will discuss later in this chapter. Molecules, such as alcohols, that contain polar bonds and that can form hydrogen bonds, mix well with water. As mentioned previously, molecules carrying positive or negative charges, ions, likewise dissolve readily in water. Such molecules are termed hydrophilic, meaning that they are water-loving. A large proportion of the molecules in the aqueous environment of a cell necessarily fall into this category, including sugars, DNA, RNA, and a majority of proteins. Hydrophobic, water-fearing molecules, by contrast, are uncharged and form few or no hydrogen bonds, and so do not dissolve in water. Hydrocarbons are an important example of hydrophobic cellular constituents. See panel 21, pages 64 to 65. In these molecules, the H atoms are covalently linked to C atoms by a largely nonpolar bond. Because the H atoms have almost no net positive charge, they cannot form effective hydrogen bonds to other molecules. This makes the hydrocarbon as a whole hydrophobic, a property that is exploited by cells, whose membranes are constructed from molecules that have long hydrocarbon tails, as we shall see in chapter 11. Because they do not dissolve in water, the hydrophobic hydrocarbons can form the thin membrane barriers that keep the aqueous interior of the cell separate from the surrounding, also aqueous environment. Some polar molecules form acids and bases in water. One of the simplest kinds of chemical reaction and one that has profound significance in cells takes place when a molecule possessing a highly polar covalent bond between a hydrogen and another atom dissolves in water. The hydrogen atom in such a molecule has given up its electron almost entirely to the companion atom and so exists as an almost naked, positively charged hydrogen nucleus. In other words, a proton, H+. When the polar molecule becomes surrounded by water molecules, the proton will be attracted to the partial negative charge on the O atom of an adjacent water molecule. This proton can dissociate from its original partner and associate instead with the oxygen atom of the water molecule generating a hydronium ion, H3O+, figure 2.14a. The reverse reaction also takes place very readily, so one has to imagine an equilibrium state in which billions of protons are constantly flitting to and fro between one molecule in the aqueous solution to another and another. Substances that release protons when they dissolve in water thus forming H3O+, are termed acids. The higher the concentration of H3O+, the more acidic the solution. H3O+, is present even in pure water, at a concentration of 10 to the negative 7 molar, as a result of the movement of protons from one water molecule to another. Figure 214b. By tradition, the H3O plus concentration is usually referred to as the H plus concentration, even though most protons in an aqueous solution are present as H3O plus. To avoid the use of unwieldy numbers, the concentration of H3O plus is expressed using a logarithmic scale called the pH scale, as illustrated in panel 2.2. Pure water has a pH of 7.0 and is thus neutral, that is, neither acidic, pH less than 7, nor basic, pH greater than 7. Acids are characterized as being strong or weak, depending on how readily they give up their protons to water. Strong acids, such as hydrochloric acid, HCl, lose their protons quickly. Acetic acid, on the other hand, is a weak acid because it holds on to its proton more tightly when dissolved in water. Many of the acids important in the cell 
such as molecules containing a carboxyl COOH group are weak acids. See panel 2.2, pages 66 to 67. Their tendency to dissociate with some reluctance is a useful characteristic. It renders the surfaces of large molecules sensitive to conditions in the cellular environment. Because the proton of a hydronium ion can be passed readily to many types of molecules and cells, altering their character, the concentration of H3O plus inside a cell, the acidity, must be closely regulated. Acids, especially weak acids, will give up their protons more readily if the concentration of H3O plus in solution is low, and will tend to receive them back if the concentration in solution is high. The opposite of an acid is a base. Any molecule capable of accepting a proton is called a base. Just as the defining property of an acid is that it raises the concentration of H3O plus ions by donating a proton to a water molecule, so the defining property of a base is that it raises the concentration of hydroxyl OH- ions by removing a proton from a water molecule. Thus, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, is basic. The term alkaline is also used because it dissociates in aqueous solution to form Na plus ions and OH- ions. Because NaOH dissociates readily in water, it is called a strong base. More important in living cells, however, are the weak bases, those that have a weak tendency to reversibly accept a proton from water. Many biologically important weak bases contain an amino NH2 group. This group can generate OH- by taking a proton from water. NH2 plus H2O equals NH3 plus plus OH minus. See panel 2.2, pages 66 to 67. Because an OH minus ion combines with an H3O plus ion to form two water molecules, an increase in the OH minus concentration forces a decrease in the concentration of H3O plus and vice versa. A pure solution of water thus contains an equal concentration, 10 to the negative 7 molar of both ions, rendering it neutral. The interior of a cell is also kept close to neutrality by the presence of buffers, weak acids and bases that can release or take up protons near pH 7, keeping the environment of the cell relatively constant under a variety of conditions. Molecules and Cells Having looked at the ways atoms combine into small molecules and how these molecules behave in an aqueous environment, we now examine the main classes of small molecules found in cells and their biological roles. Amazingly, we will see that a few basic categories of molecules, formed from a handful of different elements, give rise to all the extraordinary richness of form and behavior shown by living things. A cell is formed from carbon compounds. If we disregard water, nearly all of the molecules in a cell are based on carbon. Carbon is outstanding among all the elements in its ability to form large molecules. Silicon, an element with the same electron configuration in its outer shell, is a poor second. Because carbon is small and has four electrons and four vacancies in its outermost shell, a carbon atom can form four covalent bonds with other atoms. Most importantly, one carbon atom can join to other carbon atoms through highly stable covalent CC bonds to form chains and rings and hence generate large and complex molecules with no obvious upper limit to their size. See panel 2.1, pages 64 to 65. The small and large carbon compounds made by cells are called organic molecules. All other molecules, including water, are said to be inorganic by contrast. 
certain combinations of atoms, such as the methyl, CH3, hydroxyl, OH, carboxyl, COOH, carbonyl, C double bond O, phosphoryl, PO3 2 minus, and amino, NH2 groups, occur repeatedly in organic molecules. Each such chemical group has distinct chemical and physical properties that influence the behavior of the molecule in which the group occurs. Whether they tend to gain or lose protons in which molecules they interact with, for example. Becoming familiar with these groups and their chemical properties greatly simplifies one's view of the chemistry of life. The most common chemical groups and some of their properties are summarized in panel 2.1. Cells contain four major families of small organic molecules. The small organic molecules of the cell are carbon compounds with molecular weights in the range 100 to 1000 that contain up to 30 or so carbon atoms. They are usually found free in solution in the cytoplasm and have many different fates. Some are used as monomer subunits to construct the giant polymeric macromolecules, the proteins, nucleic acids, and large polysaccharides of the cell. Others act as energy sources and are broken down and transformed into other small molecules in a maze of intracellular metabolic pathways. Many small molecules have more than one role in the cell, acting, for example, as both a potential subunit for a macromolecule and as an energy source. It is critical to recognize that small organic molecules are much less abundant than the organic macromolecules in living organisms, accounting for only about one-tenth of the total mass of organic matter in a cell. Table 2.2. As a rough guess, there may be a thousand different kinds of these small molecules in a typical cell. All organic molecules are synthesized from and are broken down into the same set of simple compounds. Both their synthesis and their breakdown occur through sequences of simple chemical changes that are limited in variety and follow definite step-by-step -step rules. As a consequence, the compounds in a cell are chemically related and most can be classified into a small number of distinct families. Broadly speaking, cells contain four major families of small organic molecules, the sugars, the fatty acids, the amino acids, and the nucleotides. Figure 215. Although many compounds present in cells do not fit into these categories, these four families of small organic molecules, together with the macromolecules made by linking them into long chains, account for a large fraction of a cell's mass. See Table 2.2. Sugars are energy sources for cells and subunits of polysaccharides. The simplest sugars, the monosaccharides, are compounds with the formula CH2O-N, where N is usually 3, 4, 5, or 6. Sugars and the molecules made from them are also called carbohydrates because of this simple formula. Glucose, for example, has the formula C6H12O6, figure 216. The formula, however, does not fully define the molecule. The same set of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens can be joined together by covalent bonds in a variety of ways, creating structures with different shapes. Glucose, for example, can be converted into a different sugar, mannose or galactose simply by switching the orientations of specific OH groups relative to the rest of the molecule. Panel 2-3, pages 68-69. to 69. Each of these sugars, moreover, can exist in either of two forms, called the D-form and the L-form, which are mirror images of each other. Sets of molecules with the same chemical formula but different structures are called isomers and mirror image pairs of molecules are called 
optical isomers. Isomers are widespread among organic molecules in general, and they play a major part in generating the enormous variety of sugars. A more complete outline of sugar structures and chemistry is presented in panel 2-3. Monosaccharides can be linked by covalent bonds, called glycosidic bonds, to form larger carbohydrates. Two monosaccharides linked together make a disaccharide, such as sucrose, which is composed of a glucose and a fructose unit. Larger sugar polymers range from the oligosaccharides, trisaccharides, tetrasaccharides, and so on, up to giant polysaccharides, which can contain thousands of monosaccharide units. In most cases, the prefix oligo is used to refer to macromolecules made of a small number of monomers, between 3 and 50 or so. Polymers, in contrast, can contain hundreds or thousands of subunits. The way sugars are linked together illustrates some common features of biochemical bond formation. A bond is formed between an OH group on one sugar and an OH group on another by a condensation reaction in which a molecule of water is expelled as the bond is formed, figure 217. Subunits in other biological polymers such as nucleic acids and proteins are also linked by condensation reactions in which water is expelled. The bonds created by all of these condensation reactions can be broken by the reverse process of hydrolysis, in which a molecule of water is consumed. See figure 217. Because each monosaccharide has several free hydroxyl groups that can form a link to another monosaccharide or to some other compound, sugar polymers can be branched and the number of possible polysaccharide structures is extremely large. For this reason, it is much more difficult to determine the arrangement of sugars in a polysaccharide than to determine the nucleotide sequence of a DNA molecule, where each unit is joined to the next in exactly the same way. The monosaccharide glucose has a central role as an energy source for cells, it is broken down to smaller molecules in a series of reactions, releasing energy that the cell can harness to do useful work, as we will explain in Chapter 13. Cells use simple polysaccharides composed only of glucose units, principally glycogen in animals and starch in plants, as long-term stores of glucose held in reserve for energy production. Sugars do not function exclusively in the production and storage of energy. They are also used, for example, to make mechanical supports. The most abundant organic molecule on Earth, the cellulose that forms plant cell walls, is a polysaccharide of glucose. Another extraordinarily abundant organic substance, the chitin of insect skeletons and fungal cell walls, is also a polysaccharide. In this case, a linear polymer of a sugar derivative called N-acetylglucosamine, see panel 2-3, pages 68-69. Other polysaccharides, with their tendency to be slippery when wet, are the main components of slime, mucus, and gristle. Smaller oligosaccharides can be covalently linked to proteins to form glycoproteins, or to lipids to form glycolipids, panel 2-4, pages 70-71, to 71, which are both found in cell membranes. The surfaces of most cells are decorated with sugar polymers that belong to glycoproteins and glycolipids in the plasma membrane. These sugar side chains are often recognized selectively by other cells. Differences in the types of cell surface sugars form the molecular basis for different human blood groups. Fatty acids are components of cell membranes. A fatty acid molecule, such as palmitic acid, figure 218, has two chemically distinct regions. One is a long hydrocarbon chain, which is hydrophobic and not very reactive chemically. The other is a carboxyl, 
COOH group, which behaves as an acid, carboxylic acid. It is ionized in solution, COO-, extremely hydrophilic and chemically reactive. Almost all the fatty acid molecules in a cell are covalently linked to other molecules by their carboxylic acid group. See panel 24, pages 70 to 71. Molecules such as fatty acids, which possess both hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions, are termed amphipathic. The hydrocarbon tail of palmitic acid is saturated. It has no double bonds between its carbon atoms and contains the maximum possible number of hydrogens. Steric acid, another one of the common fatty acids in animal fat, is also saturated. Some other fatty acids, such as oleic acid, have unsaturated tails, with one or more double bonds along their length. The double bonds create kinks in the molecules, interfering with their ability to pack together in a solid mass. And it is the absence or presence of the, these double bonds that accounts for the difference between hard, saturated, and soft, polyunsaturated margarine. Fatty acids are also found in cell membranes, where the tightness of their packing affects the fluidity of the membrane. The many different fatty acids found in cells differ only in the length of their hydrocarbon chains and in the number and position of the carbon-carbon double bonds. See panel 24. Fatty acids serve as a concentrated food reserve in cells. They can be broken down to produce about six times as much usable energy, weight for weight, as glucose. Fatty acids are stored in the cytoplasm of many cells in the form of droplets of triacylglycerol molecules, compounds made of three fatty acid chains joined to a glycerol molecule. See panel 24. These molecules are the animal fats found in meat, butter, and cream and the plant oils such as corn oil and olive oil. Figure 219. When a cell needs energy, the fatty acid chains can be released from triacylglycerols and broken down into two carbon units. These two carbon units are identical to those derived from the breakdown of glucose, and they enter the same energy-yielding reaction pathways, as will be described in Chapter 13. Fatty acids and their derivatives, including triacylglycerols, are examples of lipids. This class of biological molecules is loosely defined, with the common feature that the molecules in the class are insoluble in water and soluble in fat and organic solvents such as benzene. Lipids typically contain long hydrocarbon chains, as in the fatty acids and isoprenes, or multiple linked aromatic rings, as in the steroids. See panel 24, pages 70 to 71. The most important function of fatty acids in cells is in the formation of membranes. These thin sheets enclose all cells and surround their internal organelles. They are composed largely of phospholipids, which are small molecules that, like Triacylglycerols are constructed mainly from fatty acids and glycerol. In phospholipids, however, the, gr the glycerol is joined to two fatty acid chains rather than to three, as in triacylglycerols. The third site on the glycerol is linked to a hydrophilic phosphate group, which in turn is attached to a small hydrophilic compound such as choline. See panel 24. Phospholipids are strongly amphipathic. Each phospholipid molecule has a hydrophobic tail composed of the two fatty acid chains and a hydrophilic head where the phosphate is located. This gives them different physical and chemical properties from triacylglycerols, which are predominantly hydrophobic. Other lipids present in the cell membrane contain one or more sugars instead of a phosphate group. Several of these glycolipids play an important role in intracellular cell signaling, as we will see in chapter 16. 
The membrane-forming property of phospholipids results from their amphipathic nature. Phospholipids will spread over the surface of water to form a monolayer of phospholipid molecules, with the hydrophobic tails facing the air and the hydrophilic heads in contact with the water. Two such molecular layers can readily combine tail to tail in water to make a phospholipid sandwich or lipid bilayer which forms the structural basis of all cell membranes, figure 220, discussed further in chapter 11. Amino acids are the subunits of proteins. Amino acids are a varied class of molecules with one defining property. They all possess a carboxylic acid group and an amino group, both linked to the same carbon atom called the alpha carbon. Figure 221. Their chemical variety comes from the side chain that is also attached to the alpha carbon. Cells use amino acids to build proteins, which are polymers of amino acids joined head to tail in a long chain that is then folded into a three-dimensional structure unique to each type of protein. The covalent linkage between two adjacent amino acids in a protein chain is called a peptide bond. The chain of amino acids is also known as a polypeptide, figure 222. Peptide bonds are formed by condensation reactions that link one amino acid to the next. Regardless of the specific amino acids from which it is made, the polypeptide always has an amino NH2 group at one end, its N-terminus, and a carboxyl group COOH group at its other end, its C-terminus. This gives a protein or polypeptide a definite directionality, a structural, as opposed to electrical, polarity. Twenty types of amino acids are commonly found in proteins, each with a different side chain attached to the alpha carbon atom. Panel 2.5, pages 72-73. The same 20 amino acids occur over and over again in all proteins, whether they hail from bacteria, plants, or animals. How this precise set of 20 amino acids came to be chosen is one of the mysteries surrounding the evolution of life. There is no obvious chemical reason why other amino acids could not have served just as well, but once the selection had been locked into place, it could not be changed. Too much chemistry had evolved to exploit it. Switching the types of amino acids used by cells would require every living creature to retool its entire metabolism to cope with the new building blocks. Like sugars, all amino acids, except glycine, exist as optical isomers in D and L forms. See panel 2 to 5. But only L forms are ever found in proteins although D-amino acids occur as part of bacterial cell walls and in some antibiotics. The origin of this exclusive use of L-amino acids to make proteins is another evolutionary mystery. The chemical versatility that the 20 standard amino acids provide is vitally important to the function of proteins. Five of the 20 amino acids have side chains that can form ions in solution and can therefore carry a charge, lysine and glutamic acid for example, shown in figure 222. The others are uncharged. Some amino acids are polar and hydrophilic, and some are nonpolar and hydrophobic. See panel 25. As we will discuss in chapter 4, the collective properties of the amino acid side chains underlie all the diverse and sophisticated functions of proteins. Nucleotides are the subunits of DNA and RNA. A nucleoside is a molecule made of a nitrogen-containing ring compound linked to a 5-carbon sugar, which can be either ribose or deoxyribose. Panel 2.6, pages 74-75. to A nucleoside sporting one or more phosphate groups attached to its sugar it's, is called a nucleotide. Nucleotides containing ribose are known as ribonucleotides, and those containing deoxyribose as deoxyribonucleotides. 
The nitrogen-containing rings are generally referred to as bases for historical reasons. Under acidic conditions, they can each bind a H plus proton and thereby increase the concentration of OH minus in aqueous solution. There is a strong family resemblance between the different nucleotide bases. Cytosine C, thymine T, and uracil U are called pyrimidines because they all derived from a six-membered pyrimidine ring. Guanine G and adenine A are purine compounds, which bear a second five-membered five ring fused to the six-membered ring. Each nucleotide is named after the base it contains. See panel 26, pages 74 to 75. Nucleotides can act as short-term carriers of chemical energy. Above all others, the ribonucleotide adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, figure 223, participates in the transfer of energy in hundreds of cellular reactions. ATP is formed through reactions that are driven by the energy released by the breakdown of foodstuffs. Its three phosphates are linked in series by two phosphoanhydride bonds. See panel 26. Rupture of these phosphate bonds releases large amounts of useful energy. The terminal phosphate group, in particular, is frequently split off by hydrolysis. Figure 224. In many situations, transfer of this phosphate to other molecules releases energy that drives energy requiring biosynthetic reactions. Other nucleotide derivatives serve as carriers for the transfer of other chemical groups. All of this will be described in Chapter 3. The most fundamental role of nucleotides in the cell is in the storage and retrieval of biological information. Nucleotides serve as building blocks for the construction of nucleic acids, long polymers in which nucleotide subunits are covalently linked by the formation of a phosphodiester bond. Between the phosphate group attached to the sugar of one nucleotide and a hydroxyl group on the sugar of the next nucleotide. Figure 225. Nucleic acid chains are synthesized from energy-rich nucleoside triphosphates by a condensation reaction that releases inorganic pyrophosphate during phosphodiester bond formation. See panel 26, pages 74 to 75. There are two main types of nucleic acids which differ in the type of sugar they use in their sugar phosphate backbone. Those based on the sugar ribose are known as ribonucleic acids, or RNA, and contain the bases A, G, C, and U. Those based on deoxyribose, in which the hydroxyl at the 2' prime position of the ribose carbon ring is replaced by a hydrogen, C panel 26, are known as deoxyribonucleic acids, or DNA, and contain the bases A, G, C, and T. T is chemically similar to the U in RNA. See figure 225. RNA usually occurs in cells in the form of a single-stranded polynucleotide chain, but DNA is virtually always in the form of a double-stranded molecule. The DNA double helix is composed of two polynucleotide chains running anti-parallel to each other, being held together by hydrogen bonding between the bases of the two chains. Panel 27, pages 76 to 77. The linear sequence of nucleotides in a DNA or an RNA molecule encodes genetic information. The two nucleic acids, however, have somewhat different roles in the cell. DNA with its more stable Hydrogen-bonded helices acts as a long-term repository for hereditary information, while single-stranded RNA is usually a more transient carrier of molecular instructions. The ability of the bases in different nucleic acid molecules to recognize and pair with each other by hydrogen bonding, called base pairing, G with C and A with a either T or U, underlies all of heredity and evolution, as explained in Chapter 5. 
macromolecules in cells. On the basis of weight, macromolecules are by far the most abundant of the carbon-containing molecules in a living cell. Figure 226. They are the principal building blocks from which a cell is constructed and also the components that confer the most distinctive properties on living things. Intermediate in size and complexity between small molecules and cell organelles, macromolecules are polymers that are constructed simply by covalently linking small organic molecules called monomers, or subunits, into long chains, or polymers. Figure 227 in How We Know, pages 60 to 61. Yet they have many unexpected properties that could not have been predicted from their simple constituents. As one example, DNA and RNA molecules, the nucleic acids, store and transmit hereditary information. Proteins are especially versatile and perform thousands of distinct functions in cells. Many proteins act as enzymes that catalyze the chemical reactions that take place in the cell, including all of the reactions whereby cells extract energy from food molecules. Enzymes are also required to synthesize the many different molecules that a cell needs. For example, an enzyme called ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase found in chloroplasts converts CO2 to sugar in to sugars in plants. This protein thereby creates most of the organic matter used by the rest of the living world. Other proteins are used to build structural components. Tubulin self-assembles to make the cells long, stiff microtubules. See figure 127b. Histone proteins pack the cell's DNA in chromosomes. Yet other proteins act as molecular motors to produce force and movement, as in the case of myosin in muscle. Proteins also have a wide variety of other functions. We shall examine the molecular basis for many specific functions later in this book. Here we consider only the general principles of macromolecular chemistry that makes all of these functions possible.